Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm requested to take a shorter time, less than 10 minutes. I'll try my best. And I will share with you the findings regarding um, viral suppression, of course, has been mentioned earlier, but we look into the drug resistance patterns and a few of their correlates in the same um, a population we are discussing today. But now we are looking into the picture that uh, since we have rolled out doltegravir, a drug that is believed to bring kind of a game changer in terms of uh, viral suppression. So uh, much has been said by the previous speakers uh, introducing um, what is really going on. But uh, of uh, importance here to mention is about uh, drug resistance which we are all aware that antimicrobial resistance all over the world is a global challenge. And HIV is not really an exception. So we need to look into that uh, in the sense that when we look an, into the efforts that are being uh, made by uh, global communities or different uh, um, institutions towards the reach of the UNAIDS target. And here we're talking about ending uh, HIV AIDS by the year 2030. So drug resistance seems to be really a barrier. And um, through surveillance or studies, we get quite important information uh, of what works in terms of treatment, which is termed as drug susceptibility scores. So this informs really us clinicians on the, what really is working. And we are thinking that we need to implement effective ART. Uh, Different reasons have been mentioned already about the higher rates of virological failure, so I'll skip that. So basically, I'm presenting the evidence that we did a cross-sectional analysis from uh, the first national um, drug resistance surveillance that was looking into acquired drug resistance, which was done in the year 2020. So. Uh, the age group we included in this analysis is the young adolescents uh, between 10, but as much as uh, young adults, so 10 to 24 years of age. And the study sites here were about 36 facilities, and these were sampled to at least represent 90% of the care and treatment clinics in the country for the surveillance purpose using a two-stage cluster uh, design whereby they first round, uh, select the clusters, and from each cluster, now we, s we randomly select the participants. So, for the period of uh, three months uh, between July and October, and we, if you all recall, we had COVID by that time, but it was, it was a success surveillance. And uh, samples that were collected from the participants were. Uh, dried blood spot samples, which had to be shipped to Canada for uh, genotyping. And the analysis was done using the usual Stanford database algorithm. So the figure on, the, on my right, and I think on your left side, uh, displays what, um, I mean, where we included our uh, study population. So we had around 2,030 participants overall. And as you all know, it's children and adults, but yeah, in between we have adolescents. So we excluded in this analysis uh, children who were aged 18 months, but younger than 10 years, and also adults who were aged 25 years. So we are left with around 578 um, adolescent and young adults. This had very lot results, and as we all are aware, we are aware that we are using a threshold of 1,000 to cut a line between suppressed and unsuppressed. So eight samples had invalid viral results from the laboratory, so we excluded them in this analysis. And then we, are, we remained with 570 uh, uh, samples. So among those, uh, 506 had suppressed, as I mentioned earlier, the threshold of 1,000. But uh, 64 participants did not suppress, and these were subjected to the genotyping. So here in this table is showing the participants' characteristics. We'll, we'll see that we had predominance of uh, adolescents who are uh, 10 to 19 years, around 93%. And uh, females, as we always hear, 
and the ART that were used, as I mentioned earlier, there was introduction or transition from using the previous effervescence based from the class NNRTI, we transitioned to doltegravir, an integrase inhibitor. So majority of them, around 84%, we are using insti-based regimen. And uh, only 11.2% did not suppress at that time. So among those who had high viremia upon one measurement, as we defined virological failure using two measurements, but for the sake of this surveillance, we had only taken one viral load measurement to define uh, high viremia and not virological failure. So we had, as I mentioned, 72% had at least one class drug resistance mutation. So I'll explain more in these figures here. So in the first figure on my, on your, on my, on my right side, you see that there's predominance of still, uh, people who are still on, uh, using NNRTIs had around 68% resistance. And we all recall that this was why we transitioned to doltegravir. And NNRTIs was the following class that is, had around 40, 44%, but the rest were really less than 10%. If we, we try to look at the proportions, if we combine, as you all know that we normally use either combined, not really dual, but triple therapy, but if we try to look at combined, using the NRTIs and NRTI, we found 42% uh, had at least a drug resistant mutation. If we combine NRTI and PIs, which we mostly use in our second line, uh, around 6.5%, NRTIs and INSTI, which is basically doltegravir here is around 6.5 percent. So uh, here just bear with the molecular mutations but I'll simply tell you what it tells. Yeah so the NLRTIs we picked the prevalence of the mutation that is mentioned there as K103N but we'll discuss in the next slides. And the NLRTIs we see the predominant M184V also around 43 percent and of not within this class the NRTIs, there's a mutation that we were expecting that to find it because this K65R selects for the tenofovir that have been broadly used in our first line. And PIs had less mutations, as you see, but of note, you see that there were emerging inst integrase inhibitors mutations. So this was just shortly after the rollout of oh, the transition of doltegravir, but we see we have some major inst mutations. When you look at the correlates or the factors, only that the initial viral load status, meaning that if a client starts ART, we know they're gonna test at six months after ART initiation. So we term this as the first viral load status, which was more than a thousand, had really a significant association with development of acquired drug resistance. And the rest of the factors were not, but of just uh, interest that the, the males also, had a higher proportion, though when we look into the statistical test, it was not significant. So what, do we, what does all this tell us? That viral suppression has been impressive, at least with the transition, as mentioned by the previous speaker, that Dolotegra very really improved the viral suppression into this age group. And uh, when we looked at the baseline characteristics, we saw more than 70% were already on DTG-based, but the viral suppression of 88% is not really a target, and we are moving toward the 95 target by the year 2025. So the previous speaker has already discussed a lot about the existing youth-friendly services. We need to tailor them or address them really in terms of the clinical outcomes, the viral suppression, which is the desired or the major outcome that we want to achieve. When we look at the, the patterns of resistance, it tells us the following information that the mutations that we see are really reflecting that these patients or these clients were prolonged on uh, failing regimens in the classes of NNRTIs and NRTI. But of course, if they were diagnosed since childhood, they were supposed to get the treatment, so there was no like, like running away from that. But if we see also, also increasing the backbone that we are using until now in terms of ART regimen, the NRTI is the backbone. We mentioned the 
tenofovir. We mentioned the other NRTIs like Zaidovudin, and we see that if those are increasing also, should it pose us to think also there's an increase of uh, uh, insti monotherapy that we are giving three drugs, but actually only one is working. And I'm aware that there are several studies ongoing, the clinical trials to, to look into this. And the presence of the timidine analog mutations termed as TAMs are also giving us a wake up call that these patients were really, st they stayed longer on a failing regimen without being detected. So are we doing much of the implementation of our policies, our guidelines? That's the question that we need to pose and look into that. And much as we are also, uh, our guidelines tells us to, to use Zydovodin in the second line treatment, and we see uh, Zydovodin is one of the drugs that be selected by the terms that we mentioned earlier, then we are in trouble. There will be no future options for the next second line or even third line um, uh, treatment. But also of note that with the prolonged mutations that we have mentioned earlier on, with these NRTI groups, is also prone to cross resistance. You might find only one drug has the mutations, but with prolonged exposure, the entire class now becomes not working. Then we are left with, the, with no options, and this can have negative impact on what we are practicing now. Then the imaging uh, insti mutation that I mentioned earlier on can tell us that maybe we needed to have baseline uh, detection of the mutations, or did we have prior minor mutations that were not detected, and with the use of an effective drug, doltegravir, now they have been amplified, and we are seeing them now. But then in the near future, we are going to have failing regimen. PIs have maintained their low resistance, so it's really not, not really a big concern. But then a significant other factor that I mentioned is that we are not really defining biological failure using one measurement, and we might need to rethink again that is this, the, if the initial one, the first value load at six months, is showing a strong association with development of drug resistance, then we really need to emphasize either to revisit our timing of viral load testing, much as we are using the dotegravir, a much faster drug that can cause viral suppression, at eight to 12 weeks, and we are doing at six months. So this is also a, a call that needs to a review. But also we need to underscore the early detection of high viremia, so that the earlier the better we can prevent earlier on rather than exposing to a prolonged failing regimen. So in conclusion, um, this analysis shows that more than one in 10 adolescent or uh, youth had high viremia, and we had seen among those with high viremia, there were few in sample, but among those with high viremia had clinical relevant um, mutations that really are calling to, to review how we are going to prevent development of acquired drug resistance tests. And so, based on the finding that the first viral load test was really a significant factor for developing drug resistance, we recommend to revisit and either perform genotypic testing at that juncture where it is detected or during switch of ARVs. This is the time when we use viral load results to switch from or from one line to the second, or sometimes we recycle the NRTIs. NRTIs are really still the backbone of any regimen, be it first, second, or third. And also, we, as we have already rolled out doltegravir in children, it's ongoing in the country, but in the, in, in the young adolescents, we need periodic assessment of viral suppression in the context of uh, using TLD. And then also evaluate the differentiated uh, service models that we are using in adolescents, and are they really doing us any good, or do we need to do uh, or stretch ourselves much better? So that's all, and I would like to acknowledge the, the Global Fund that provided uh, funding for this surveillance, the MUHAS uh, team, my supervisors, my mentors, um, Professor Bruno, Professor Tumaini Nagu, and Said Abud, their, his um, mentorship, Professor Wafai and Christopher Sudfeld, Professor Mugusi as well, and um, also uh, my uh, hospital for giving me time to make this analysis. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Joan.